Good evening. Good evening. My name is David Simpson, and I'm the program director here at the Fine Arts Work Center. And I'd like to welcome you to a wonderful event that we have in store for you this evening. We're glad you're here. Typically on a Tuesday night during the summer, we'd be hosting a faculty event, but tonight we have a very special guest, a son of Provincetown, a beloved member of the Falk family, artist Romolo Del Dio. <laughs> Romolo has previously represented the United States at the G7 conference in Italy in 2017. He is a recipient of the Harvard President's Award for Contributions to the Arts, the McCord Prize for Creativity, the Harvard Danforth Award for Excellence, as well as awards and grants from the Sumner Bird Foundation, the Gottlieb Foundation, the Sugarman Foundation, the Henry Moore Foundation, and the New York Foundation for the Arts, amongst others. He has created the largest public sculpture on Cape Cod and is the founder of the Provincetown Public Art Foundation. He maintains studios in Provincetown and in Pietra Santa in Italy. Romulo's work has been described as reinvigorating ancient techniques, exploring ideas that speak to us from a place that feels familiar and yet also distant and elevated in times past. Tonight, Romulo will discuss the development of his sculpture, The Tree of Life, Which is Ours, which is on display at the Marina Ressa Gardens as part of the Venice Art Biennale 22, and which was inspired partly by climate science and partly by myth. This artwork presents the artist's approach to a sustainable art practice for the 21st century, which he refers to as long art, a platform for environmental and social cultural activism. This approach repurposes artisanal methods from antiquity, which require the investment of an artist's time, utilizing natural materials as an alternative to the industrialized mass-produced processes and products that are driving global warming. Romolo's presentation tonight will be followed by a Q&A with the audience. But before we begin, just a bit of housekeeping and other items of interest. Books by this year's faculty will be for sale in our bookstore, which is uh, in the middle part of the gallery over here, and at the back of the room, as well as some very pretty Falk merchandise. Uh, not to mention lovely posters of Romolo's exhibit at, at the Biennale, which he has uh, brought as a gift to everyone who's attended. So let's hear it for that. That's very lovely. The, new, the newly relocated and renovated Hudson D. Walker Gallery will be open, is open now, and it will be open after the event. So if you haven't seen the exhibit in there, you should definitely check it out. It's called Density's Glitch, and it, formers, it features work by former Falk Fellows. The proceeds of all work sold will go to support Fox programs, so I hope you'll check it out after the presentation this evening. Restrooms are located down the hall, two of them. And finally, do us all a favor and turn your cell phones to silent. And now, without further ado, I'm so honored and pleased to welcome to the Fox stage, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming him, Provincetown artist Romolo Del Deo. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, basically, I don't need to do the talk now because David has done such a beautiful job of introducing me. I feel like he's covered all the bases, and we could just go on to whatever. But if you'll indulge me, I did put together a slideshow. And what it chronicles is I wanted to share with you my experience of the last really 12 months. Uh, in August of last year, I got notified that I had had my design proposal accepted to be exhibited on the waterfront. And there started a process that was um, essentially be careful what you wish for. <laughs> but before I get into that, I, I would like to thank Sharon Poli, the director of the Fine Arts Work Center, and David Simpson, and also Sarah Siegel, uh, who are all in charge of the summer program. And uh, I really, I have to say, I'm so happy to be here tonight. This is the first time in this new space uh, New Stanley Kunitz, I hope he would like it. Uh, I think he would. And I just want to say about how 
important the Fine Arts Work Center is. And in back of me is this photo from La Biennale in Venice, and which this huge institution now, the world converges on this amazingly city. But in a way, in some sense, the Fine Arts Work Center is like a little Biennale because it focuses this energy of young, emerging, accomplished artists, people at all levels of career, contributing to each other and lifting each other up. And that's also, I think, really a model for what Provincetown is, that uh, it's a community that exists in our community because of its ability to sustain the creative people in it. And nothing speaks more to sustaining the creative people in it than the Fine Arts Work Center. And as you know, we're heading into the fundraising season of the summer when these organizations, which survive entirely by donations, count on us to do our part in their own way. Some can make financial contributions, some can make contributions to the organizations that can raise money or time, energy, or just devotion. But we all need to do our part. And what makes Provincetown also special, also like a little Venice, is because also here, everybody participates. And it's this level of participation in the arts which really makes it all possible. Uh, my family, uh, we have the honor, the pleasure, and the joy to have been supporting this organization for over 50 years. And I hope for another 50 years at least. And without further ado, I'm going to challenge the technology to my left and start the show. And I will just say that I'm not going to talk about the slides necessarily. They're just going to run. The narrative is this. It starts with a few shots of Venice, of, of the Biennale, of just a sense, obviously, nobody can do it justice. There are, I, can't, I don't even know how many pieces of art are in the this year, but essentially the whole world is there. And you can spend days and days making discoveries. And after you've visited all the primary pavilions, there, you'll be walking down a little street that looks like, you know, okay, it looks like something out of a fairy tale from the 16th century, but all of a sudden you'll see this sign, there's a padiglione, and you go in and it's like the Armenian pavilion and it's an extraordinary piece. And it, you wouldn't even know, it's, you know, it's almost like it's not, it is on the map, but the map is so complicated, who can follow it? And anyway, every time you try to follow a map in Venice, you immediately get lost <laughs> because the city was designed as a maze. And without further ado, I'm gonna roll that, so it's gonna be Venice, and then, like I said, be careful what you wish for. I'm going to show you my process uh, from trying to find out what I want to say with this opportunity, with the platform I've been given, and then to execute on my, my desire to, to make that happen, and then you know how that came out. And I'm hoping in the q and I'm sure that have questions about various aspects of this, and I really encourage you to grill me. And, uh, and then I'm gonna just talk as it, as it rolls, okay? And hopefully that will be enjoyable for everybody. Does my computer recognize me? No, it doesn't, because I'm not wearing my glasses. <laughs> so here we go. Ah, and it works. <laughs> Wonderful. So you probably all, um, no Venice, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance in your lives to go there, but Venice is, it's one of those things that for me and the um, biennial is a, something you wish for, uh, something you dream about. It never really feels real. And when you go to Venice, it still doesn't feel real. There is never that pinch me moment when you say, oh yeah, this is real. You just, you just sit there and you travel through the place and you traverse its streets and, and you just say, how is it possible people actually live here, that people do this, and that this whole thing carries forward? And I think it's, a, it's an incredible testament to vision and it's also an incredible testament to aesthetics, to the idea of making decisions that are driven 
by a desire for beauty. And I had originally thought in my ignorance that Venice was primarily in one period. And I learned that that's not at all the case, that actually this community spans many centuries of construction and is still ongoing. And what they've done is they've managed to create a vernacular about how they work and the ways in which they work, which guides the entire concept of Venice. So on the one hand, you have this incredibly harmonious environment. And then within that is this interesting thing where that kind of solidity opens up the possibility for many forms of invention. And I've been to many art fairs all over the world, and there's something about the level of invention in Venice which strikes you more deeply because it is in such contrast. And I think that this is also one of the things that when we are working in practice or looking at art or looking at context with art, sometimes things need to be set off. And when everything is like everything else, sometimes you don't see it as much. And it seems to be stuck on this for some reason. What happened here? Hmm. Why isn't that progressing? All right, let's stop it and start it again. Ah, OK, so it just got sleepy. Uh, this is um, a uh, painting. It's a, a group of small paintings in which it continues to be stuck. I hope this isn't going to the whole show. Of a Belgian. Oh, it's the file's too big for it. Oh, yeah, look at that. That's not good. <laughs> hmm. I wonder if I should just win this. Now, let me try this, because I can't see my screen. Maybe I'll just do it manually. And that will solve that problem. This, um, this piece here is uh, in the Ukraine pavilion. It was uh, a series of funnels. And this is Barbara Kruger. Now, I don't want to do it like this. I really do want to do it as a slideshow. Try it one more time. OK. So far, so good. So far, so good. Hopefully, well, that uh, little painting that gets caught up on, it's a very interesting thing. It's a Belgian painter. No, it's doing the same thing. Hmm. Oh, we were doing so well. Um, all right, we're just, we just, we're going to just have to wing it, stop the slideshow, and do this a different way. So, let me get my bearings one second. The, the thing about juxtaposition, so you're going to look at all these places, and you're going to see the spaces that they're in, the spaces are rich. And a lot of times when we think about how to do things, how to present, how to think about art, uh, looking at a place that's not homogenous, that's not um, just institutional, can set things off. And I, I think that one of the reasons why Provincetown is so effective as a location for art is that 
it presents an alternative to the institution in the same way that you have this sense of juxtaposition, that you have this contrast, and it allows, in a way, space for the thing to be. This is that Armenian thing. It's actually quite beautiful to see, and it works with a sound piece that goes with it. Uh, it's really impressive. This is in the main pavilion. This is uh, Simon Lay's, one of her very beautiful sculptures inspired by um, uh, 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 what Cowry shells, I believe they're called. And, and this, whole this whole installation was part of the American Pavilion, which was actually very beautifully thought out this year. And really um, great to see how they focused on this one artist and then successfully made the one artist be a, um, a complete statement about, you know, a lot of countries focused on one artist's statement, but I really get a sense of an examination of America of the last two years through Simone Le's um, uh, pavilion. It was, it was very beautiful. This piece in particular, to me, spoke more of figurative pieces because it, it's, it, it transcended just the idea of a, of a sculpture. I, I work figuratively, and I'm always impressed by people who can utilize other elements to tell that kind of sculptural story. And I've thought this piece is very successful. This was very funny. Uh, there were a lot of things about being in Venice which were comical. And this guy was looking for a wife. Uh, he went everywhere. Everywhere you went, you saw this person. Uh, he's pretty much an institution there, I suppose. But this is also the, the sense of levity that's, that's part of this. It's just. I'm just going to go through this. This is um, Anselm's uh, installation at the Doge Palace, which was also extraordinary uh, because I was looking at this and I was thinking about the whole concept of challenges, the challenges we face as artists. And I don't know how he even imagined to do this. Uh, it's extraordinary, it's vast, and the context which, which it's placed in is daunting. And what was interesting was to go from the room of Tintoretto and to feel that these things actually did belong together. There wasn't actually a disconnect. And it was very, very successful. And now I'm just going to get into a little iconography about Venice. Uh, this is the Louise Nevelson installation, also extremely beautiful in Piazza San Marco. And this is the um, winged, the, the lion of San Marco, who is a symbol of Venice. And I think that I'm going to stop talking about the slides individually now and try to just do my talk, because it sort of threw me off that I'm not going to just let the slides roll. You have to forgive me. But when I was researching this project, I, I was looking at slides of Venice and trying to absorb the place and trying to understand how my work would fit there. And when I started studying the site, uh, I was looking for a way that my work, and these are just examples of my work from the studio and whatnot, uh, which is very interested in, in my Greco-Roman traditions, which may seem ironic coming out of Provincetown where you don't necessarily assume that this kind of work is what's being done. But I, my father is a painter, we all know, uh, Salvatore Del Deo, and he um, introduced me at a very young age to Edwin Dickinson. And Dickinson had a very unique perspective on painting in Provincetown where the, he studied a lot of antiquity, he painted almost as if he was painting uh, statues sometimes. There's this tremendous planar understanding. And those of you who've had the fortune to go to Pam have seen uh, the work of Phil Balakote. And Phil was, as my father was, a student of, of Edward Dickinson. And you get a sense of this incredible, powerful presence, uh, which I also absorbed. But 
the other thing about being here is our proximity to the sea. And one of the things we're all thinking about is uh, sea level rise. It's actually, for us here, an existential threat, as it is also for people in Venice. And one of the manifestations of sea level rise is a phenomenon called ghost forests, which you touched on in the, in the opening. And ghost forests occur when the seawater rises up in the ground and desiccates the trees. They're, especially big trees like oaks and maples with long tap roots, they suck that water up high. And we're beginning to see examples of this all over the world. Our community is not an exception. And I think in some ways you could imagine that these ghost forests are kind of like a canary in a coal mine. They, they show us what's going to be happening. They show us that it is real, that there is a lot of, of talk uh, when people debate climate science that we are really looking at what they call a periodicity that, you know, that sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold, we shouldn't get all worked up. But we're looking at trees that are hundreds of years old, that are now dying, forests that have more than just a climate fluctuation, a, a you know, decadal fluctuation. And so this is the thing telling us that sea level rise, climate change is real, and we need to pay attention. And I did want to, I, I work a lot with driftwood. Uh, it's, as all of us in this community know, we're surrounded by a, a wonderful pieces of driftwood we find on the beach, and incredible things that are, okay, that's not driftwood, but this is getting to the site. Uh, I find it very inspiring. And, so I started studying the site where my sculpture was going to go, and it's populated by Italian pines. There was a surprising thing that I discovered when I, I went to this site, is that the pine trees tip to the water. And I wondered, why are these trees tipping to the water? It doesn't make any sense, because here on the waterfront, the trees all they try to get away from the salt spray and away from the wind. And really, they don't lean towards the water at all. And here, they, these trees lean so much. Look at this. This is a huge pine tree that they have to brace them. And they're all pointed. Why is this? Well, it is a similar phenomenon to ghost fires. But these trees are so resilient from all the years of flooding that they have created an adaptation where they send the roots in the opposite direction of the water. <laughs> and so they send them away from the water side so that the trees can survive. But in so doing, they tip the trees over into the water. And they routinely have to replace these poor trees because these giant pine trees just keep on tipping over. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, oh my god, this is so sculptural. I need to work with this, because this is where my sculpture is going. I need to make this space part of the thing. And I'm looking at my driftwood that I, I love to get inspiration out of, drag home incredible quantities of the stuff to my studio. And, I, and I'm looking at these trees, and I'm thinking about ghost forests. I need to do something that ties together my driftwood practice of creating forms and finding shapes with these trees and with these forms of Venice. And, and one of the earlier slides, completely out of sequence because I completely lost the map here. Um, I showed you the, the lion of Venice, this lion with wings. And I was thinking, when I looked at all of these, there's all these columns with these winged lions everywhere. And for the life of me, they kept on making me think of our boats, especially our old draggers, which always used to fly uh, a fisherman's staysail is a little triangular sail up in the top of the mast. And they did that not to power the boats under sail, but to help them manage the waves, to keep them stable. And I'm looking at these tipping trees and all these canals and all this really almost, imp it's impossible to imagine how all these buildings are standing in the water and they're all stone. And I'm thinking, these lions, this lion of, of Venice, is a symbol of stability. And he stands on a column, and yet he's unmoved, like this city. 
And so I started thinking about this, this idea of, of how that related to what I was working on. And I was searching as I worked with, I was collecting all kinds of driftwood and, and working with it and, and studying it and trying to find ideas that you know I could kind of bring into something. And it's, it's hard because, you know, I really felt this opportunity, but I also really felt the, the pressure to bring it all together, to say something. And I labored away in my studio with Driftwood, and this video goes on. And studying all kinds of forms. And then I began to pull uh, molds off pieces of wood that I found because I realize that, in general, I do this in my practice, that when I work iterative, iteratively, iteratively uh, that I get freer. And so I'll start with something that I find. I'll make a mold. I'll work with it. And then I'll make another mold. And then this process has another direction because, as I said, I, as you saw, I work a lot with um, antiquity and with things that look like broken pieces from the past, and I will sculpt something, break it intentionally, make a mold of that, break it again, <laughs> make a mold of that. And this, this iterative process combines with my work of finding things, and I kind of try to find the place where these two processes meet. And so very much I was hoping that would happen. And here, this is an example. This is a piece that I sculpted, made a mold of, and then broke, looking for things that connect it to the driftwood. And that's the wax before I broke it, so you know I'm not lying. <laughs> and what is this? Oh, yeah, so I'm back twisting around here. And I begin to combine elements. And you can see that I'm far from where I broke. And I had this piece sitting in my studio, which was originally a demonstration I did for some students, where I wanted to teach them about seeing, about not, um, not really going from detail to detail, but just looking at the whole subject, thinking about it, and then just doing it. So I, did a, I do a thing when I teach where I study the model and then during the model's break, I sculpt a head. And the reason I do that is that, okay, it's not going to be an exact likeness. But if you're paying attention, it can give you a feeling of the model. And sometimes a feeling is more important than a likeness. Because it's a feeling that tells you that you're actually looking at something that represents the thing you're trying to achieve. And, uh, you know, I'm in good company because uh, Michelangelo is, is famously quoted as saying, when told that his portrait of his great patron, Lorenzo de' Medici, who essentially made his career happen, that Michelangelo's portrait looked nothing like him. He said, look, in 100 years, no one's going to know what Lorenzo de' Medici looked like, <laughs> but everyone's going to know what his portrait looked like. So I feel I'm on good ground here. So anyway, I had created these wings out of uh, some things from driftwood and things I'd found, and I stuck them on this head. And all of a sudden, the other thing I was doing was like, no, this figure is somebody. But I didn't know who, and I thought about it. And this is me uh, actually making wax trees. Uh, this is the process of painting the wax into molds. And, uh, and I thought about how do I bring this all together? And who is this figure that I was playing with? And I was still struggling with the idea I had, a much more serious and somber um, piece that was kind of like a sentinel. But I was thinking, well, when you talk about the intersection of ideas like uh, ghost forests and sea level rise and these trees in the Marina Ressa Gardens, you think, well, what connection does that have to our sort of human story? And who embodies that? 
And I thought, well, okay, what happened here? Well, I thought, well, you know, there is one figure that really knows what it's like to be a tree. And that is uh, Daphne. And I started thinking, Daphne, if she's a tree and she's aware of what's going on, that she is embodying us, that we are all actually facing this peril together, uh, but that we have a sense that like the trees are disposable, they're not really, but she is a tree. Uh, for those of you who are not up in mythology, um, Daphne was, um, well, Cupid, who is, you know, it portrayed in, in modern um, sort of treatments as this cute little baby who shoots arrows of love and then people fall uncontrollably in love with each other. This is the kind of hallmark version of Cupid. Most of these gods had a dangerous side. Uh, nothing in Greco-Roman mythology was ever black or white. Everything had a duality, much like life. And so Cupid had a dangerous side. He also had arrows of repulsion. And he had a grudge with Apollo. And all these gods had grudges with each other. It was like a schoolyard. Right? Yeah, just, <laughs> you know, very instructive about humanity. You know, when we, when we despair of how we behave, if you look at how the Greeks and Romans describe the activities of the gods, you realize, well, what hope do we have if divine creatures are constantly settling scores? But anyway, we'll try to be better than the gods. So what he did to Apollo was he shot Apollo with an arrow of attraction to the beautiful uh, water nymph, Daphne, who was the goddess of free flowing water, of free movement, and essentially the epitome of somebody not tied down. And into Daphne, Cupid shot the other arrow, the arrow of repulsion. And so she could not stand Apollo. She couldn't be with him. She didn't want anything to do with him. She would have preferred to die than to be with Apollo. But uh, she sought, I think Poseidon may have saved her. Forgive me, I've, I'm a little rusty on that part of the myth at this moment. But essentially, he tr she was transformed into a tree so that she could escape the affections of Apollo, who Unfortunately for Apollo, even she was a tree, he couldn't stop loving her, which is why the laurel wreath is the symbol of peace and of success, because Apollo made the laurel tree the symbol of his championship, and he distributed the laurel everywhere. But uh, we're stuck on the slide. I've got to do a better job of giving you a slideshow. And so, and that's me lighting my studio on fire. <laughs> Um, being a pyromaniac is an important part of working in wax, just so you know. So I've, this is also, you can see, I'm working with uh, pieces of heads. So I began to work with this idea of making a Daphne who was connected to this tree made out of driftwood, uh, or at least castings that der derived from driftwood. And the sculpture began to tell its own story. This is all the process of, of sculpting wax. And, and the piece begins to come together and find its own path. And one of the reasons why it was important to, to work iteratively was so that I was not locked into what driftwood was, that I could move things around and bend them and twist them and really bring the things that I was working from into the realm of this incredibly complex tree growth that was around this piece, that would be around this piece in Venice. And this is the model. This is the original model. I actually ended up making two. One that was kind of like a structural theme, and then another one where I explored the leaves that, that surround Daphne. Both of the models are on display right now at Berta Walker Gallery, along with another group, which is um, about a completely different myth, Cassiopeia. So, 
I had a busy winter. But, you know, that's what Provincetown winters are for. Um, one of the beauties of, of living and working here is that everybody leaves, nobody's left, and you have no choice but to make art because there's literally almost nothing else to do. And this is, I'm beginning to bring together this, the different pieces. Um, I'm finding directionality in the forms I cast of trees that create a structure that, to me, pine trees in the Medina Rasa Gardens. And I'm also working with a large version now, sculpting of what I, I imagine as Daphne, my, my interpretation of her. And all of this happened at an accelerated rate because the, the sculpture, in order to be ready for April 1st, had to be in the foundry the first week of January. And this photo here, I think, is the first week of January, and the sculpture was not ready. <laughs> and every other day, they would come to me and say, Romolo, when are you shipping this thing? And I would say, Carlo, soon, soon, just patience, patience. And they were, they were very understanding, but it was, you know, it's a, and, and also, he kept on saying, so how big is it now? <laughs> because when I um, originally scheduled it into their production schedule, I said, no, Carlo, don't worry, it's not going to be that big. It's going to be maybe two meters, about six feet. And then I said, Carlo, it's a little bigger. It's three meters, about nine feet. <laughs> so around this time when it's really late, and mind you, uh, my studio is 16 feet high. So <laughs> yeah, so the sculpture ended up being 14 feet high. <laughs> and it was when it shipped two weeks late. And then because, and this is me in the days finishing it up, because this year was an unusual challenge for all of us, uh, there are many different things that happened. Uh, and this, I think, for artists in general is something we always have to realize, that pretty much everything that will go wrong is absolutely going to go wrong. And you should respect it and welcome it and see what comes from it. And this, this process was an exception. I did this whole large sculpture in wax, and I finished it, and I packed it up, and I put it in two crates, and I called the shippers, and they came and they picked it up in Provincetown, which is always a challenge because nobody ever wants to come out here in the winter. <laughs> and and it was on its way, and I, I called the foundry and said, okay, it's on its way, you know, there's no more worry. And then I got a call from the shippers the next day, we can't ship it. We have staffing drawdowns, and we're cutting out a lot of our stuff. You have to come and take it back, and it's in Revere. Uh, because this, I shipped it in the beginning of January, which was the first big Omicron wave of COVID. And it hit the industry extremely hard. A lot of the major shipping was down, and uh, a lot of flights were canceled. And essentially, between that and the backlog already existing in shipping from COVID, they said, you know, this thing is not going anywhere. So uh, a week of extremely protracted ensued where I essentially tried to find a way to get this wax to the foundry so they could cast it in lost wax bronze and I finally succeeded in doing that and it flew to Germany arrived in whoops that's too soon that's Italy it arrived in the airport in Germany and immediately they closed down the warehouse because of COVID <laughs> and then they lost the sculpture <laughs> And of course, that wasn't a problem because at this point, the piece was only four weeks late on an already late schedule. And we're getting close to the end of January. And the founder is saying, Romolo, we don't know if we can cast this in time. And so you know how I 
everything that will go wrong is going to go wrong. So also, you also just have to be, I think, as an artist, just absolutely irrational optimist. Because first of all, if you spent a lot of time being an artist, chances are nobody ever said that was a really good idea. You know, that nobody ever said to you, oh, you want to be an artist? Excellent, you're going to have an easy life, everything's going to go your way. This is the conversation that no artist ever has. Everyone says, really? Oh, you want to be an artist? And then the next thing they say is, so how are you going to live? And uh, so you have to be an optimist. You have to believe, ultimately, that things are going to work out. And you have to essentially take your, your art practice as an article of faith that somehow, through some agency or another, and just through sheer dogged determination, you will carry this project and everybody involved with you forward to where it needs to go. And you just simply can't give up. And this was one of the cases. I got the sculpture found. I got it to Italy. We made the molds. And this is the, the rubber mold in process. And I, I love, like, <laughs> this is actually a beautiful thing in all in and of itself. This is a detail. And there were a lot of conversations where I was being told that I was crazy and that it couldn't happen. <laughs> this is another piece in progress. And the other thing about it was that the tree arrived shattered uh, because the, clearly the, the, the case basically was broken. So fortunately, the figure was fine, but the tree arrived in many pieces, and all of this red wax, this is a special mixture, patching wax. And you can see this is the size of the pieces. And I said to Carlo, the guy who I said, so if I just stay here all weekend putting this thing back together, can we try and cast it on Monday? And that's what I did. I, I stayed there and I put the whole thing back together. Uh, it was a real challenge, but and here's the thing, is that, okay, so my entire process is about making molds, finding things, breaking things, working with them, putting them together. I was given this incredible opportunity to rethink everything I'd done because I had to rebuild the whole damn thing in just, you know, basically two days. And I think that the sculpture is better for it, interestingly enough. And the sense of n almost working without being able to think it almost became like a kind of um, action painting in a way. And so I, I had this feeling like if I stop to think too much, then I'm not gonna be able to do this at all. And I just had to keep moving. And now this is the piece, we've made a mold. This is the wax that will be used for the actual casting. And it's always this intense red wax because it's the ugliest possible color. <laughs> And the reason it's the ugliest possible color is it shows up every defect. If it looks at all good in red wax, that's great. You, you've really accomplished everything. Because it's never going to look worse. This is a wing being molded. This is the, the wax being painted into the mold for casting. This is retouching the wax. Because when it comes out of the mold, it's never, it's never, it always needs fixing. It's me putting the tree back together. <laughs> I don't look happy. <laughs> and you can see all the pieces, you know. It was, it was like a giant three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. But we finally got everything together, and this is the investment. This is the ceramic material that's wrapped around the wax and then fired. And when it's fired, it's as if you were firing a piece of pottery. Hard. And everything that wax burns out. And you can see at the top here, there's like little tubey things sticking up. Those are the, the vents where the, the uh, vapor is going to escape. And in the center, you can't quite see it, but in another photo, you can see it. There's a cup. And that's where you're going to pour the molding metal. And then roll them along this. And, and that's, and this is the oven where it's fired. It's, it's large, it's on rails, and this is how it's done. And 
So because the fragmentary nature of not having the rolling slideshow, I haven't really gotten into my whole thing about talking about material processes. But as you can see here, what you're looking at is a process that hasn't really changed in thousands of years. And the primary difference between what they're doing here and say what the Egyptians were doing is that instead of using forced air over carbon, they're using forced air with piped gas. And the other big change is that they have fire protective suits, which is, I think, a good improvement. And they have harder steel for the crucibles and things like that. But a lot of these processes are essentially unchanged. And one of the beauties, and that's a repeat, one of the beauties is that once this piece is made, the, the process of working in these old traditional materials uh, takes a lot of energy. One of the things I talk about is I talk about the half-life, the carbon half-life of an artwork. And a lot of people say to me, well, you talk about being aware of the energy usage and thinking about a carbon footprint of art. Well, this process uses a lot of energy, and it's absolutely true. It does. It takes a tremendous expenditure to make a sculpture this way. However, one of the opposite sides of that coin is that if you think about the life of an artwork as like an arc, where you have this creation when you're putting a lot of energy into it. So some artworks have a steep curve where they rise quickly. You expend a lot of energy, say, pouring bronze or welding or doing something of that nature, which consumes, has a large energy consumption profile. But then, once made, it falls off a cliff. There's work made this way won't need any more attention in terms of energy for thousands of years. And when I talk about life, I don't talk about it as a, um, a thing where there's a right and a wrong. But what I mean by long art is that art that takes time to make can have a valuable impact on thinking about our practice as artists, on what we do, and how it impacts, impacts the environment. Uh, I've had a lot of interesting discussions with uh, curators and with people in um, museum um, preservation and restorers, and they share with me the challenges that they face trying to preserve a lot of work that was its original intentionality was to express a moment, to talk about, okay, I've found this, or I've done this, or I've expressed this, without thought for the process of making it. And I think it is Saul LeWitt who said that uh, the purpose of art is the idea, not the making. And I appreciate where uh, he's coming from, that ideas in art are extremely important. And I, I spend a lot of time thinking about the ideas in my art. But idea alone is a problem unless you're willing to let the idea go. Because what happens a lot of times with art making is that the energy required to take the art that's not made in ways that are durable, in ways that essentially don't require a constant input of energy to maintain them, is that they become continuously taxing on the environment. And one of the things we're all thinking about as artists right now is the issue of NFTs. And some of my students have even gotten NFTs, and they say, Romolo, what do you think about NFTs? And I say, well, I love any idea where there's a chance for artists to be able to get remuneration. That's a great thing. But the problem is, is that what is the actual cost of the NFT? And, uh, NFTs, uh, for those who don't know, are uh, non-fungible uh, transactions. They are a way of using blockchain to essentially barter um, graphics. And they require tremendous computation. So even though these things don't exist as actual objects, they are running on servers, which continuously burn energy. And so I think that it's 
not so much important to decide, you know, how one should work, but that one should understand the way that you're working, what the impacts are. And then everything is amenable, everything is changeable and editable. We can work to find ways to ameliorate or compensate. But a lot of times um, artists were, were guilty of greenwashing. We, we kind of feel that because our politics are in a certain orientation and our feelings and our emotions and what we appreciate is oriented a certain way, that we're not actually responsible for the impacts of what we do. And I think that we need to grow beyond that. We need to think about how we work, what its carbon impact is, and what the long-term effects are going to be. And a lot of this is not really the artist's fault, because I don't want that there. Because when a lot of art was um, made, no one really thought about it in terms of the marketplace. Artists just had an idea. They got excited, like me when I had my eureka moment in the studio. And they just want to do it, because essentially artists just like to make things. But we live in a world where if we're successful with our ideas, they're turned into products and commodities. And for us not to address that outcome, hence live in a bit of denial. So I think that it's behooved upon us to think about how we work, what impacts what we work are, and how we could change things. Uh, one of the things that I've seen in my lifetime is that when I first started working, many of the art supplies that you could find in a typical art supply store were essentially unchanged for the last, say, 200 years. Uh, most, maybe I would say 50% of the things had no mass production element. They were essentially from small craft shops and small producers. A lot of it was handmade, uh, basically natural materials that had been turned into products you could buy. But now, when you go into an art supply store, most of the things that you're buying are essentially catalogs of natural materials that artists have traditionally used. So instead of, say, paint, which is made with linseed oil and usually just basically dirt, colored dirt and pigments, you now have acrylic paint, which is uh, basically um, derived from polyvinyl chloride. And uh, a lot of the pigments are various complex aniline dyes, also a petroleum product. So, while uh, people will be very comfortable with the concept of, say, acrylic paint, because it doesn't have a, um, you, you don't smell it like you do, say, oil paint, uh, that whole thing of vapors is sometimes misleading because while for the artist experience, it may seem that it is low in impact, to get the product into that tube and into your hands is not. And in the past, artists actually would just take linseed oil and say some earth from Sienna or some you know, ultramarine lapis lazuli and grind it on a stone in the oil and paint with it. You don't even need to have it in a tube. And those actually produce very beautiful things. And if you draw, if you go into a store and you say you want to draw with uh, charcoal, you're going to see Conti, paint on, uh, Conti crayon and, and various types of um, drawing materials. If you look at them, they're all composites. They're all petroleum composites with, with essentially uh, black is um, a uh, petroleum uh, black that's created. The red is an aniline dye, but for much of civilization, they use actual burnt charcoal, willow, and to do the red color, say, that's famous in like Da Vinci drawings, that was just a stone called hemite, which is a very common iron ore stone, which it's beautiful to draw with. It's not that it's necessarily bad to use a Conte crayon or a Koninor crayon or any other kind of material like that that's made. It's just that we don't consider the alternatives anymore. That, and these things aren't even available. To find them, you need to actually go sleuthing. And so 
one of the things when I go around and I talk about long art, what I'm trying to do is just make people pause a moment and think, if I use this, what brought it into my hand as opposed to, say, using that? And maybe I don't need to use this thing that is essentially coming out of the petrochemical industry. And if I work in a certain way, maybe instead of just doing the most expedient ground, if I use, say, a more permanent ground, then in 50 years, some poor restorer is not going to have to take this entire painting off of his stretcher, do the, you know, go through this incredible labor to stabilize it. That when we lived in the era uh, that Saul described, Saul described of the era of ideas, that things were driven by ideas, nobody put a priority on thinking about, should I paint with house paint or should I buy a tube of Windsor Newton? Because the primacy of the idea drove the artwork. But now, dealing with those artworks which are important and beautiful and you know, in no way should they be taken away from us, it has become a tremendous burden to maintain them because of the way they were simply made. And this essentially is the, is the kernel of thinking about long art and thinking about how things are made. And so long art is about, this is, um, this is a boulder of Tupo rock, and this is another thing that I'm working with, where a lot of stone that's used in sculpture is um, just like coal or any other material that's extracted from the ground. And I wanted to think about how I am using my work and my materials and what I can do better and what I can change. And so I'm working with boulders that are naturally occurring from avalanches and using them in my work instead of work instead of stone that's quarried out of the out of the ground as a way to work with a material that has uh, less of an impact on the environment. And here the piece is finally coming together. And this is uh, probably like uh, March 29th or so. <laughs> and this is the final stage really of which is the buffing, which is on a piece this large, incredibly rough work, especially when you're under the gun. Now, the, holding on to this thing is essentially like spending a day wrestling with a boa constrictor <laughs> because it's a tool powerful enough to polish bronze. And, and you can see, this is where, where I've, I've worked on this piece, and remove all of the scale that's on the metal so that the comes out, but it's incredibly powerful and very heavy. So when you get done with that piece, you feel like you've been in a prize. And the final step of putting a piece together like this, okay, we're not quite there. A little bit of repeat. I just want to get just the model. The final step is patina. And one of the reasons why bronze lasts essentially invulnerable for centuries, even millennia, is because the last stage is to rust it, to do what's called patina, which is to trick nature. Nature wants to turn bronze either black or green, depending on what kind of air and pollution you have. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can make bronze be any color that your design, your idea, really wants within a sort of range of earth tones. And there are many artists who will put other kinds of surfaces on bronze, and that's another way of doing it. But I really like to see the metal. I like the metal to exist within the patina. And so I try to work with patina processes that show the metal and also speak to the sculpture. And what I wanted to do with this piece was, if you recall the beginning of my slideshow, I don't know if you know it, I had this lion of San Marco that's over um, the, the church of San Marco, all in gilt gold. And I thought, my Daphne, if she's going to Venice, should be golden, like the lion of San Marco. But I wanted the trees that I created to live with the trees 
of the Marina Resta Gardens. I wanted them to feel like they really, like you almost had to go up to them and touch them to understand these weren't actually the pine trees. And so uh, this is me getting to work and working with a torch. And this is the whole process of, of patination. It's, uh, I loved doing patination um, because it's, it's the final dance with the sculpture, really. It's the, it's, the, it's the process that brings it all together, but it's also your way of saying goodbye. And those of you who are artists know that the, one of the hardest things to do is to figure out when things are done. And one of the gifts of working in this particular way of working in bronze is that the patina is your long goodbye. And when a sculpture this big, it's a fairly long goodbye, too. It takes, it takes a couple of days to do this, working around the clock. This is me working on the tree, laying the base, the base layers. Now it's coming along. You begin to see I'm working in the colors of the actual trees. Try to work the whole piece all over. It's, it's, it's a challenge because the patina only takes when the, when the metal is at a temperature and different temperatures change the color and different oxidation levels in the torch change the color so you're constantly switching things around to try to bring all the colors where you want them so it's kind of like painting with a flamethrower if you can imagine <laughs> but I, I love it it's what I love to do and now I'm beginning to get into the tonalities of the pine tree and it's, it's tricky because in Patina, this is, you know, the amazingly gorgeous place where I work, uh, which is also just a wonderful thing to be, to be, to turn around and look at a mountain village behind you while you work. These are the different Patina chemicals that I'm using to create this. This is a bismuth nitrate creating that effect, which is basically like Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> I'm working on the gold. That's basically done. This here, I love this photo. By the way, all of these photos, all these amazing photos, uh, one of the, the, the great things about this experience, and it's so beautifully documented by my wife, Tatiana, who is a photographer, and to when I was looking through all of these photos and thinking about this thing, I was, I was thinking what a, what a great um, honor and, and, and privilege it is to have this process completely documented because when I was doing it, I was always so under pressure that I really know what I was doing. And, and I look back and I say, oh my God. <laughs> and so I'm deeply grateful to have these beautiful photos and this is the invitation to the actual opening. And I decided that I really wanted to focus on the trees. I wanted people to be surprised. So this is just a photo of the bronze of the tree. And this is where it's located, right here, right in the center of that garden. And here I am setting it up. And she's arriving. And you, you talk about this idea of the stasel, of the sail, of the wing that keeps something balanced. When I was looking at her being brought in and stabilized, and I was thinking, I, most of us who are artists, we, we have these ideas in our heads about the things we do. And, Sometimes we lie to ourselves, and sometimes we tell ourselves important truths. Uh, it, it kind of varies, but we have a kind of conversation in our heads about what we wish things were. And it's not always the case. Sometimes we get bitterly disappointed, and, and a lot of times we start, what drives us forward is our disappointment. You know, I tell my students that my whole life I've gone from failure to failure, and that's what drives me forward to do the next piece of art. Because if you had too much a sense of success, then it's time to put down your brushes or your chisels or your 
or whatever you work with because you're done. You succeeded. It's this sense of, of not succeeding think that helps to drive us forward, this constant never being satisfied. But within that general dissatisfaction, which is the lot of all artists, there are moments when something feels right that you say, yeah, I got that. And while there are things that in this sculpture disappoint me, the, the thing that I wanted, this sense of balance, of her being balanced on this tree and belonging there in this garden with these other trees, I really felt like that I did, and it worked. And it was a huge, a huge thing for me. I, it was this odyssey, and it went by in a blur, and I look at these and I don't even know the days. I, and I feel so grateful for the opportunity, and I learned so much from it. And I'm just going to, we're almost at the end of this slide, and I'd really love to talk to you all and hear your questions. And this is, the, this is the, getting close to it. And this is, you can see what I was going for because I knew it was going to be going in this position and I wanted to move with the behind it and be part of it and be there, but also to be part of the incredible Rococo Venetian experience and tie the nature and the Venetian iconography together with a story about us becoming a tree. And I think that's the last slide. No, it's not. <laughs> okay, I got some repeats here, but you know, I love my sculpture. And Oh, this is um, an art that just came out in one of the editions of the art newspaper, and I um, forget off, but I'm very extremely proud of this. Um, this is an article of the about the most uh, remarkable, their words, not mine, uh, pieces at the Biennale. This is from the Danish Pavilion. Um, This is the Brazilian pavilion, which is incredible. You walk into an ear, and it's all of these organs which are moving. Uh, really astounding pavilion. Um, I can't do all this. This is a German pavilion. Um, no, it's not. It's not. The, it's an individual artist. Um, I think that this piece is. Um, uh, anyway, uh, this is for me very disappointing. The Italian pavilion. I thought really kind of dated, but anyway. Uh, they also selected my work, and I, I, oh, well, you know, you, we all do these things, and then there's this tremendous sense afterwards of, it was exhausting, and a lot of times you do this thing where you put everything out there, and Afterwards, there's this almost sense of internal collapse. And you wait for something to happen. And, you know, I'm, I'm 63. And I wanted to do something like this my whole life. And I've been trying to do something like this my whole life. And when I got the offer, knowing how much time there was, knowing what they wanted me to do, knowing what I wanted myself to do, I wondered if I could even do it. And I did do it, and then I wondered if it mattered. Because when you put yourself out there, you put yourself completely out there, and then most people don't respond. Um, this piece where it is in the garden, uh, half a million people will see it, but most people will just see it and walk on. And Every once in a while, somebody pays attention. And, and that's an amazing thing when it happens. And I, you know, I'm happy with the 40 plus years of waiting for someone to pay attention to a thing like this because that moment is what makes it all worth it. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of artists really struggle 
it's not easy. It's, you know, when people ask me, I was talking about, you know, that great question you always get, how are you going to make a living? Well, my students ask me this all the time. How do I make money off my art? I say, well, for most of my life, I did it, but I made money off my art skills. And I urge everybody, I say, look, protect your art. Do what you love to do. Don't worry about what everyone else is doing. And I, I certainly did, and I went off in a completely different direction from all my friends. And most of my career, they thought I was a little bit crazy. Um, but I was happy doing what I was doing because when I did it, it made sense to me for who I am. And what I tell all my students is I say, there are no answers. There is no right way. Do what makes sense to you. Do what actually works for you. You are the only honest broker of your ideas. And you're the only one who knows what you think and what makes you feel rewarded when you work in your art practice. So, yeah, I, I think that it's time to take your questions. And I, I'd love to talk to you about, you know, not just me talking. So who has a question? Yes, over there. I just want to say thank you. I paid attention <laughs> to the whole thing. Well, thank you for sticking it out through the technical glitches in the beginning. I learned a lesson about downloading all the material to your drive for the future. <laughs> there's always something that, that intrudes like that. It never fails that there's something. This, but we got through it. And, and thank you for your forbearance and your patience. Another question. Well, yes. Um, so this is a permanent right? No, 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 it's not. It's only six months. Oh, okay. it's, uh, it comes down on the 27th of November. Mm -hmm. And right now, actually, we're planning the closing ceremonies. And if all goes according to plan, we're going to do a concert in the uh, Palazzo Mora, which is a beautiful palazzo on the canal. Um, also, I think 16th century, just absolutely incredible. And the concert is going to be um, work by um, an Italian composer who actually saved me from this piece. Because when I was struggling in the first days, uh, I, part of how I work is I listen to a lot of in my studio. And I find music to be very visual. And it, sometimes it carries me. Sometimes it holds me, and sometimes it just brings something into my head. And I, was, I like to listen to uh, contemporary composers whenever possible, because I think like this. If we living artists don't listen to other living practitioners in other fields, what the hell? You know, like, who else is going to do it? It's, it's only right that we should pay attention to others. And so I am constantly searching through stuff. And I found this composer who unfortunately just had died. Uh, his name was Ezio Bosso. And he was a remarkable figure. He, he died very young. I think he was barely 50. Uh, he died um, two years ago. And he had a degenerative condition. He slowly lost control of his body. But he performed and composed right up until the end and wrote around his abilities, his disabilities. And in some ways, the work later on in his career, because he started out a virtuoso, but the work when he got more and more constrained, you can see him, there's videos of him performing, and you can see the gyrations he's going just to play the piano, but the, the, the desire to create, to overcome the obstacle, it's so apparent in the music. And he only wrote two symphonies in his life. And the second symphony has never been recorded like by a real symphony orchestra. But uh, a group of performers in, um, I think, in the, in the Piedmont Alps did a, a performance of it, and somebody recorded it. And so it's this live recording. And I happened upon it. I didn't know anything about it. And I'm playing this piece. and. All of a sudden, I don't know, it's just like everything started clicking with me. And it, all of these ideas I've just gone over, this slideshow, started coming together. And I 
at the name of the piece, and the name of the piece is Under the Trees Voices. And what was interesting about that, which actually gave me chills at the time, is that most of the voices you hear are not performance voices. They are mostly little Italian children playing in the background. And to this, this piece with this unusual ambient background track made me feel like I was actually in the Marina Ressa Gardens Park working on my idea. And I could hear like little Italian kids in the background because if you've ever been in Italy, they're like everywhere. Like, you know, <laughs> you can't get away from them. And it really put me in that place. And then I realized that this piece was about trees and that the second movement is called the tree's sacrifice. And, and you know, that really, I just, I stopped. It. And so I want to do this concert, um, and I'm actually talking to the Bosso Foundation, which is run by his nephew. It's a small organization, but we're going to do a concert um, dedicated to Ezio Bosso and the gift he gave us of his music and, and to this piece of the inspiration to sort of tie it all together because the other thing about doing all of these kinds of things is recognition, acknowledging what got you where you are. So I really want to do that piece of it. It's very important to me. Another question? Yes, back there. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> this is sort of two-part, but were you assigned the site or did you choose it? And were there parameters you had to work within? Yeah, good question. Um, I didn't have any, um, I didn't have any uh, input in the site. Um, I. I basically won the lottery. Uh, my piece is in the center of the garden, right on the main path. Um, it's got the canal in back of it. Uh, it. It was just a piece of good fortune, really, uh, or good curation, if you, you know, somebody, the piece wanted to be there, and the people who were curating it, and curating large scholars is not a joke, because it's not like you can put it here, put it there, you kind of have to pick your spot, and that's it. And maybe you can turn it a little bit, but pretty much you're locked in. They did an excellent job from my point of view. Maybe the other sculptors in the park think they didn't do such a good job that they should have my spot, but I, I'm very grateful. Um, and the other question was, was I confined in my... Yeah, that was a really interesting thing. Uh, the whole thing about getting into the show was a series of coincidences and um, not to be glib, but I have COVID to thank for a lot of it. Uh, I was actually supposed to have a retrospective um, at the Museum of Contemporary Art in St. Petersburg, and then COVID came along, and that show got canceled, and the director decided to do a, another show which was brought to her by the um, Ministry of Culture from Italy, she decided, because I was Italian enough, to squeeze me into that show. And so she put in, um, in during the, um, the reel there, you saw this piece with like a face, like almost like a sunflower on a stalk. And she put in that piece. And uh, the piece was about, the show was about mirrors. And so that's kind of like, a, in a way, like a mirror, a face on a stalk, like a hand mirror. And, uh, the People involved with the Ministry of Culture of Italy saw the piece, saw the show, were very involved with it. That piece got a lot of attention, just by law. Um, and even getting that piece to Russia during COVID was also another crazy challenge. Fortunately, now, of course, completely impossible to do, and I wouldn't want to do it. Uh, but at the time, it you know, it happened, and. It was because of that piece in that show that I got invited by the uh, European Cultural Center to do this piece for the Marina Teresa. And they wanted essentially a larger version of that piece. And so I kind of started with that piece and started working with it. And you saw these early phases. I was basing it off of that piece, trying to do it bigger, trying to work with the idea. But it didn't want to go there. 
it wanted to be a different sculpture. And so at a certain point, I sent them photos of what I was doing. A different direction now, and they were wonderful about it. And they, they were incredibly supportive. They, they never attempted to um, armchair quarterback what I was doing. And, and so in that sense, the whole thing was just a, a string of fortuitous circumstances. And I was very lucky. It could have been very different. I've had situations where there's micromanagement, and it, it pretty much almost always kills all of your love for what you're doing, saps all the energy out of the piece, and you end up worrying more about what these people are going to say to you next than what you should really be worrying about, which is the artwork you're trying to make. And so this was, I guess, in that way also an ideal situation. Another question? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, the tree, I yeah. understand, and Daphne, I understand. And I, I'm i wondering about your feeling when you were, um, you had the inspiration on the wings. Did it have much to do with um, Daphne as a god, as a goddess, or was it more um, the wings of Venice and the lion and the wings of Venice and trying to bring the Venice history into it? I just had two conflicting feelings about wings. Excellent question. Um, the, I never imagined that she should fly. And I don't see the wings as being um, flight, you know, in, in, enabling. Um, but I always that she could land. <laughs> and and again, you know, uh, I was, you know, very taken. I've, I mean, my whole life, I've looked at this. And when you go to Venice and you go to Piazza San Marco, in the center by the water with nothing else around it is this really tall column. I mean, it's very tall. And there's this lion at the top of it. And his wings are spread. And you don't get the feeling like he's going to fly off somewhere. He's, he's there. And he's staying there, and he's going to be there for centuries. Thank you very much. And that, to me, was the epitome of this. They just not, it, you know, they, they use um, the wing um, metaphor is used in a lot of, of different things, not just the lion. There's a book with wings. I believe there's a serpent with wings. The wings appear in many different um, Venetian um, iconographic things, and they have no real myth. It's not like a chimera or some other animal from a classical bestiary. It's just this Venetian thing. And it doesn't have a name. When you ask a Venetian, what do you call this? You know, assuming it would have some kind of special name. They say, it's just, you know, the, they, they call it Leone Alato, which means lion with wings, or Leone di San Marco, which means the lion of San Marco. That's it. So, the wings, for me, they did impart that quality of a divinity. And they also gave it that sense of stability. And, you know, when you saw it coming down on the tree, I, would, I felt like, yes, it's sitting there, but she needs the wings to be balanced on top of that tree. So I hope that that answers your question. Another question? Yes. Hi. Yes, I, I would love to. Um, actually, we were planning um, the um, museum that got me this show in Russia was planned. They have a courtyard, and they're right on a canal, which is actually a canal that figures very prominently in Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. Um, I, the name of it escapes me right now, but it, it's, it's beautiful. And the bridge f across this canal, right in front of the museum, has these big lions on it. So I thought, like, wow, this would be so cool that we were going to do the show there. But Putin had other plans, unfortunately. So no, show, no shows in Russia for a long time, probably. Uh, but uh, that, was the, that was to be the next destination. Now we're looking at other possibilities. Uh, we'll see what, what happens. There, there are a number of, of potential things.
that's on the horizon. But the um, exhibition schedule has been shuffled by international events. Because that was going to be, basically we were going to do the show that postponed that led to this whole thing in the first place. Another question, yes, hi. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like by the time we got to the end there, it was just like this really like emotional experience. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for the for, for the journey. I thought it was just well, beautiful. Thank you very much, and I'm glad you 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 were here. And and, and yeah, I we all I think all artists are basically infatuated with our processes and and sharing them. You know we don't really get to do very much. Mostly people just th see the thing as it's done. And I imagine what better place to share a process than this place which is all about artist process. This place, for those of you who don't know, was created on the principle that emerging artists could come here and really find their way and, and, and develop their process to become sort of in, you know, like a safe space that they could be here and just focus on their work and not be so buffeted by the challenges of survival, which were bad in 1968, but are even worse today. And the, the importance of places like the Fine Arts Work Center and other places like it that still exist is incredibly important. I tell people all the time, the reason why Provincetown is still a vibrant art colony is because of the Fine Arts Work Center, because we are constantly attracting young, worthy, talented people to this community. And we, sh you know, we are incredibly grateful that you continue to succeed at, at being here. And I encourage everybody to participate any way they can. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, one last thing. At the back table, 